my beloved brethren and sisters and friends, <clears throat> much is being said of deep crime which darkens heaven's windows. We shudder at the immoralities which terrify us. We nearly panic at the divorce frequency and broken homes and delinquent children about us. But perhaps sometimes we should stop to reflect that all are not criminals, all are not bad, and all are not rebellious. Years ago, I repeated an experience I had in portraits. In the temple on the fourth floor is the room of the Council of the Twelve Apostles with large chairs in a semicircle. Here, important meetings of that body are held. Around its walls are portraits of the brethren. When I came to this service, I looked upon them with admiration and affection, for these were truly great men with whom I was associated. Some time later, authorization was given by the First Presidency of the Church for my portrait to be added to the others. Lee Green Richards was selected as the artist, and we began immediately. I sat on a chair on an elevated platform and tried very hard to look handsome like some of the other brethren. <laughs> After some weeks, the portrait was exhibited to the First Presidency and later to my wife and daughter. It did not pass, and, <clears throat> and I was sub to submit to a redoing. The angle was changed, the hours, many of them were spent, and finally the portrait was near completion. This particular day was a busy one like most others. I suppose I was daydreaming, quite detached from the world. Apparently, he had difficulty translating my faraway gaze onto the canvas. I saw the artist lay down his palette and paint, fold his arms, and look straight at me, and I was shocked out of my daydreaming by the abrupt question, Brother Kimball? Have you ever been to heaven? <clears throat> My answer seemed to be a shock of equal magnitude to him, as I said without hesitation. Why, yes, Brother Richards, certainly. I had a glimpse of heaven just before coming to your studio. I saw him assume a relaxed position and look intently at me with wonder in his eyes. I continued. Yes, just an hour ago. It was in the holy temple across the way. The ceiling room was shut off from the noisy world by its thick white painted walls. The drapes, light and warm. The furniture, neat and dignified. The mirrors on two opposite walls, seeming to take one in continuous likenesses on and on into infin infinity. All in the room were dressed in white. Here was peace and harmony and eager anticipation. A well-groomed young man and an exquisitely gowned young woman, lovely beyond description, knelt across the altar. Authoritatively, I pronounced the heavenly ceremony which married and sealed them for eternity on earth and in celestial worlds. As we concluded, a radiant father offered his hand and said, Brother Kimball, my wife and I are very common people and have never been successful. <clears throat> but we're immensely proud of our family. He continued, this is the last of our eight children to come into this holy house for temple marriage. They with their companions are here to participate in the marriage of this, the youngest. They're faithful to the Lord in church service, and the older are rearing families in righteousness. <clears throat> I looked at his calloused hands, his rough exterior, and thought to myself, here is a real son of God fulfilling his destiny. Success, I said, as I grasped his hand, that's the greatest success story I've heard. 
you might have become, uh, accumulated millions in stocks and bonds, bank accounts, lands, industries, and still be quite a failure. You are fulfill fulfilling the purpose for which you were sent into this world by keeping your own lives righteous, bearing and rearing this great posterity, and training them in faith and works. Why, my dear folks, you're eminently successful. God bless you. My story was finished. I looked up at the artist. He stood motionless in deep thought, so I continued. Yes, my brother, I've had many glimpses of heaven. Once we were in a distant state for conference, we came to the unpretentious home of the state president midday Saturday. We knocked at the door, and it was opened by a sweet mother with a child in her arms. She was the type of mother who did not know that there were maids and servants. She was not an artist's model nor a society woman. Her hair was dressed neatly, her clothes modest. Her face smiling, and though young, she showed the rare combination of maturity from experience and the joys of purposeful living. The house was small. The all-purpose room into which we were welcomed was crowded, and in its center a long table and many chairs. We freshened up in the small bedroom assigned to us, made available by farming out to the neighbors some of the children, and we returned to this living room. The stake president soon returned, made us welcome, and proudly introduced to us all of the children as they returned from their chores and play. Almost like magic, the supper was ready. Every child gave evidence of having been taught responsibility. Each had certain duties. One child had quickly spread a tablecloth, another placed the knives and forks and spoons, and another, another covered them with the large plates turned upside down. The knives and forks were not silver. The dishes were inexpensive, too. Next came the large pitchers of creamy milk, high piles of sliced homemade bread, a bowl at each place, a dish of fruit from the storage, and a plate of cheese. We all knelt at the chairs facing the table. One young son was called on to lead in family prayer. It was extemporaneous. And he pleaded with the Lord to bless the family, their schoolwork, the missionaries, the bishop. He prayed for us, who had come to hold conference, that we would preach good. And for the little cold, shivering lambs being born in the lambing sheds on the hill this wintry night, a very little one said the blessing on the food, and thirteen plates were turned over, and thirteen bowls filled, and supper proceeded. No apologies were offered for the meal, the home, the children, or general situations. The converse, conversation was constructive and pleasant. The children were well behaved. In these days of limited families or childless ones, when homes often have only one or two selfish and often pampered children, homes of luxury and servants, broken homes where life moves outside of the home, it's most refreshing to sit with a large family where interdependence and love and harmony were visible and where children were growing up in unselfishness. So content and comfortable were we in the heart of this sweet wholesomeness that we gave no thought to the unmatched chairs, the worn rug, the inexpensive curtains, the smallness of the house, or the number of the souls that were to occupy the few rooms available. I paused. Yes, Brother Richards, I've glimpsed heaven in many places. He stood listening, seemingly eager for more, and almost involuntarily, I was telling him of another flight into heavenly conditions. This time it was on the Indian reservation. While most Navajo women seemed to be prolific, this sweet Lamanite wife in their several years of marriage had not been blessed with children of their own. Her husband was well employed. These new converts to the church were buying their weekend groceries. As we glanced at the purchases in the large, well-filled baskets, it was evident that it only wholesome food was there. No beer, no coffee, no cigarettes. You like postum, do you? We asked them, and they uh, 
answered, and their answer touched our hearts. Yes, we've had coffee and beer all our lives, but since the Mormon missionaries told us about the word of wisdom, we use postum, and the children like it. Children, we asked. We thought you were a childless couple. This brought from them the explanation that they had filled their home with 18 Navajo orphans of all ages. Their hogan was large, but their hearts even larger. Unselfishness, the milk of human kindness, love unfeigned. These good Indians could shame many of their contemporaries who live lives of selfishness and smugness. I said to the artist, heaven can be in a hogan or a tent, Brother Richards, for heaven is of our own making. I was ready to finish the picture, but apparently he was not so inclined. This time I was in Hawaii in a beautiful little temple at Laia. It was a missionary group. The spirit was there. The proselyters could hardly wait their turns to bear testimony of the Lord's gospel. Finally, the little Japanese missionary gained the floor. By the pulpit in her stockinged feet, she knelt reverently and with a heart near bursting with gratitude for the gospel and its opportunities, she poured out her soul to heaven. Again, I found heaven in Europe. Elder Vogel was a local convert German boy of great faith. His parents refused to assist him in the mission, which he so desired to fill. A kind American member helped with a monthly check to assist with the mission expenses. He enjoyed his work and all went well for a year and a half. One day a letter came from the wife of his sponsor advising that her husband had been killed in an auto accident, that it would be impossible to send any more money. Elder Vogel kept his disappointment hidden and prayed earnestly for a solution. As he and his American companion, Elder Smith, passed a hospital one day, a solution of his financial problem was born in his mind. The next day he made an excuse and was gone for a time. When he came back, he said little, but went to bed early. When I asked the reason, he said he was a little extra weary. A few days later, Elder Smith noted a small bandage on the arm of the German brother, but his quest was passed off lightly. His quest. This time passed, and Elder Smith became suspicious of the periodical bandages, until one day, unable to keep his secret longer, Elder Vogel told him, you see, my friend in America is dead and cannot longer give support to my mission. My parents are still unwilling to help me, so I visit the blood bank at the hospital so I can finish my mission. Selling is precious blood to save souls. Well, isn't that what the master did when he gave his every drop? Do you believe in heaven? Brother artist, I said, yes, that is it. Heaven is home and family. It's understanding and kindness. It's interdependence and selfless activity. It is quiet, sane living, personal sacrifice, genuine hospitality, wholesome concern for others. It's the living of the commandments of God without ostentation or hypocrisy. It is selflessness. It's all about us. We need only to be able to recognize it as we find it and enjoy it. Yes, my dear brother, I've had many glimpses of heaven. I straightened up in my chair and posed again. The artist picked up his palette and brushes, did some touching up of the portrait, and sighed contentedly as he said, it is completed. In due time, it was placed with those of others of the brethren in the council of the 12 room on the fourth floor of the Salt Lake Temple, where it hangs to this day. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches men to live righteously, to make the family supreme, the home inviolate. It moves the characters of its adherents toward faultlessness. It is the true way. If lived rightly, it will ennoble men toward godhood. May the true gospel of the Master reach into the lives of all of us I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.